And this morning we have a, a very interesting program on Turkey, uh, looking at the legacy of its failed coup uh, a few years back. And um, our moderator this morning will be Dr. Aaron Stein, who wears many hats at FDRI. He's our uh, director of research, our Middle East program director, and our national security acting program director as well. He also uh, is the creator of our podcast, The Middle East Brief, as well as the creator and co-moderator of the War on the Rocks Arms Control Wonk podcast. Um, he does many things for us, and uh, we're really thrilled to have him here this morning. Um, our guests this morning are Dr. Liesel Hintz and uh, Salim Koru, who's one of our FPRI um, Black Sea Fellows. Um, uh, before we get started, and I'll let Aaron do a fuller introduction, before we get started, a couple housekeeping notes at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll down and hover over the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat but button. Um, with that button, you can ask questions, and we encourage you to do so. Um, thank you to our sponsors and our members, uh, without whom we could not bring you these kinds of events. Um, so thank you for that. And for those of you who aren't members, come check us out. Uh, we have a very robust website full of interesting and informative um, formative articles. And um, this morning, as I mentioned, we're talking about Turkey, which is always an interesting and important country to watch. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Aaron Stein. Thank you, Raleigh, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, depending on where you're, you're dialing in from. Uh, I see people from around the world. Um, we have a very interesting chat um, this morning to talk about four years after the failed coup attempt uh, in Turkey and the evolution and trajectory of Turkish for, uh, of domestic politics, uh, and perhaps in the question and answer, we can dive into uh, foreign policy as well. We have about an hour today, uh, and uh, I, I, I like to finish my events on time, so we will finish on time. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the two panelists. Um, as Raleigh mentioned, we have Dr. Liesel Hintz, who is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins uh, SAIS, and Mr. Salim Koro, who is an analyst at TEPOB in Ankara and a Black Sea Fellow at FPRI. Um, and we're going to do about eight minutes of opening remarks. I will do a little bit of moderated discussion thereafter. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, which we absolutely uh, encourage. Um, feel free to type into the chat function. Um, I will collect your questions um, and pose them to the panelists. Uh, so if you see me typing on the uh, on the screen, uh, I'm not answering emails. I'm trying to collect uh, uh, questions. So with that, um, I think I will turn it over to our first speaker. Uh, which one did we say we go first, Liesl or, uh, or Salim? I can't remember. I think Salim is going to start. Salim will start. So without further ado, um, Salim, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll keep it very brief and, and quick. Um, first go over uh, some of the facts of the coup attempt and then some of the, the structural transformations. I remember because I was moving into a new apartment in Ankara and uh, this, this, this happened very abruptly. And um, I, uh, at the time, after sort of witnessing the events, at the time I thought this is, this is either going to bring the country together a little bit, but what is more likely is that it's going to fuel a, a sort of a, a very rapid change, uh, a very rapid transformation of the country along the lines of So we saw very, very quickly, um, well, I think most significantly in, in structural terms, we saw uh, the enactment of the presidential system or the super presidential system, however you want to call it. And, and that really entails the, the immense centralization of the apparatus of government in Turkey, right? Um, that really... Um, I think forms the core of um, the, the government's the government's process right now. What happened, for example, recently is that um, uh, the government 
brought together a lot of um, capital groups and, and, and banks, state-owned banks together. And that, for example, allowed it to or through some of the coronavirus related things very quickly. So it, it, it's been giving out lots of loans, for example, in order to uh, keep the economy going. Or uh, what it's been doing is it has been bringing a lot of the sort of military industrial complex, if you will, uh, or, or uh, a, a, an early form of it together under its wing so that it's been able to uh, produce or, or hypercharge a lot of the a lot of the technologies that it needs in order to be active in in several different areas in, in foreign policy. All right. And also very importantly, it engages in a lot more symbolic moves. So we'll do things like um, opening up the Hagia Sophia, right? And, and Hagia Sophia obviously has been um, for a long time a very important um, a sort of touchstone of, of Islamist and sort of, and, and broadly just romantic political movements in Turkey, right? The Pan-Turkic and others. It's been, it's been very important in general in terms of symbolism in terms of what the Turkish state represents and, and how it defines itself. So it's doing a lot of those things, right? Um, so in those three fields, I see the government moving ahead pretty quickly uh, in the years ahead, right? So we'll do things like, um, in terms of centralizing the economy, it will it will increase, it will, it, will, uh, it will advance doing that, right? It will, it will control more of these capital groups. It will control a lot more of these banks and it will try to um, nationalize a lot of the economy, right? Which is what it's already been doing with, with a lot of tariffs and, and, and other tools at its disposal. In terms of uh, sort of we'll continue that process as well. It will, we've already seen that its involvement in Syria has given it lots of experience and it has used that experience in its involvement in Libya, right? And those things will feed off of each other and it will be much more involved in the, the Eastern Mediterranean, right? And only today in the news, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about Azerbaijan and the Armenian Azeri conflict. And Turkey has been wanting to be much more active in that conflict for a long time. So we'll, it will be so uh, in, in the future, much more active. And in terms of symbolism, we'll see a lot more happening as well. Um, there have been a lot of things that conservative governments have been wanting to do, but haven't been able to do. We'll see things like, um, I mean, things that nobody in mainstream media is talking about, like a return to the Islamic calendar, right? Um, a greater emphasis on the Ottoman alphabet and really having an independent sort of cultural sphere where, where these historical narratives are brought to the fore, right? And um, having a an independent sort of cyberspace where where there are alternative social media types that, that China, for example, has that uh, the Turkey will want to do, right? So those things, I think, are all um, things that um, that we have to expect going forward in Turkey. I think I think that's all. I'll I'll, uh, I'll be okay. happy to answer questions and, and contribute further on. Okay, and uh, Salim, if you have a window open, perhaps you could close it while uh, while 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 Lisa is speaking. So, Lisa, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thank you for having me, and thank you to all of you for for joining us today. 
Um, you know, there's been so many changes that have taken place over the last four years since the, the coup attempt. I think it's almost frustrating or, or difficult for us to remember all of them. So I'm really glad that Selim um, pointed to the structural transformations that have taken place. Um, and the switch to the presidential system um, uh, and Erdogan being elected president in 2018 is just one of those, but it's a huge component that in some ways was made possible by the coup attempt. So the theme of this is kind of the legacy of the coup attempt and how can we understand some of the many, many economic and structural and societal and educational changes that have happened in Turkey. And if you remember, um, you know, there's this famous quote from Erdogan saying that this, you can translate it in different ways, but this was kind of a gift, right? This, this coup was a way for, at least in the way that a lot of opposition members and Turkey observers interpreted it, was a way to consolidate control, use security threats as kind of a reason to impose a state of emergency, under which, by the way, the referendum to approve the presidential system was carried out, right? Um, as was the presidential election itself. And that also made possible a number of power consolidation uh, steps. So you have this ability to consolidate power, to kind of drum up this uh, vision of an internal threat that needs to be purged and thereby, you know, end up purging, detaining, arresting, uh, you know, uh, targeting hundreds of thousands of individuals, irrespective of whether they were uh, affiliated with the Gulen movement or not. You have a sort of societal targeting um, of anyone who is suspected of being uh, a traitor, someone suspected of maybe being involved, someone through, you know, kind of whatever spurious claims that you may make up, um, you know, essentially being able to label them with this really wide paintbrush of being a terrorist. And that is an extremely effective rhetorical tool to be able to marginalize any kind of opposition, whether it's to, uh, you know, get them fired, to detain them, to harass them, to intimidate them from not speaking up, um, to cause them to leave the country, all kinds of different ways in which the legacy of that coup can help us understand how Turkey's opposition faces as many challenges as it does today. The rhetorical sort of what I call rhetorical vilification that is kind of painting opposition members as inherently disloyal, inherently terrorist. That's a strategy that uh, then Prime Minister Erdogan, now President Erdogan honed during the Gezi Park protests, um, really naming and blaming and framing anyone who is part of the opposition as uh, someone whose uh, punishment was justified. And now you have this again used as a way to purge individuals from institutions. And so the structural transformation that Selim mentioned is incredibly important. It's not just the consolidation of power in the presidency. It's the economic structures that he mentioned. It is the reconfiguring or marginalization or redistribution of power amongst a number of institutions from the education system, uh, the military system in terms of the curricula that cadets go through. Um, look at the changes to the Bar Association that we've seen recently, right? So now um, in order to kind of try to disempower those Bar Associations in large provinces that were calling out human rights uh, violations and so forth. Now there's a law where you can establish if you have enough lawyers in a particular province, a rival bar association. So there's many, many different ways this structural transformation is taking place. The opposition, you know, clearly is uh, sort of hamstrung by the fact that there is increasing consolidation of influence over the media. So like the holding groups, um, these economic, you know, uh, sort of powerhouses that Selim mentioned as well, you know, they own media channels. And at this point, you have about five holding groups that are influenced or tied to the government by their construction interests and financial interests and banking interests. And so they're not in a position to air any kind of critical uh, opposition in the media. So on all of these different platforms, whether it's the media or education or politics itself or uh, the legal, uh, the, the judiciary, 
you have a consolidation. The opposition has always been fragmented in Turkey along a number of different lines we could talk about. Um, but there have been attempts to try to sort of rally together. There's still an immense challenge, I think, for, um, say, the main opposition Republican People's Party, despite the changes that it has gone through, um, despite generational changes, uh, despite uh, a new uh, sort of softer, gentler approach, the radical love strategy that's been written about, um, there's still challenges in, say, you know, forming an alliance with the, um, the People's Democratic Party, the pro-Kurdish Liberal Democratic Party. Um, and I'll, I'll just wrap up here. I want to be brief and then leave the, the time for discussion. But in terms of the challenges that the opposition face, I think we would be remiss if we didn't point out the deliberate targeting of uh, Kurdish, uh, ma Kurdish majority municipalities. At this point, 47 of the 65 elected municipal heads in pro-Kurdish areas have been removed from their posts. Some are in jail, uh, some are under investigation, but that is 72% of the officials in Kurdish majority regions who were elected have been replaced by AKP trustees. So I know I was kind of supposed to focus on the opposition. I think I focused more on challenges the opposition faces, um, but I think that's important to recognize um, as we think about looking forward to elections in 2023 or possibly earlier. So let me jump in right there and I'll ask the first question. Um, you know, if that, that coup attempt, you know, July 15th, um, you know, I, I guess basically four years ago, how would you suggest that the AKP has evolved electorally thereafter? You know, so how has it constructed its, 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 both its domestic politics in terms of how it frames um, its relationship with foreign actors? And let's say in this case, Europe as a block in the, in, in the US um, as one country. And two, what the challenges you know, Erdogan is facing right now. Uh, if you look at opinion polls in Turkey, he's probably the most unpopular he's been since he was first elected in 2002. Uh, is that driving some of his actions you know, in terms of, um, of domestic policy and, and how he frames foreign policy? And so maybe I'll, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll pick right up with, with Lisa and I'll come back to you, Salim, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think what we have to remember uh, in terms of the AKP's sort of um, base and what's happened to it, uh, we have to go back even a year earlier, which was 2015, which was the reinitiation of the war with the PKK. Um, it was the split with uh, or the end of the peace process uh, with the Kurds. Um, it was a falling out with the People's Democratic Party um, because their party had, which is again the pro-Kurdish Liberal Democratic Party, um, had received 13% of the vote in the June 2015 elections and so thereby took away the AKP's parliamentary majority. All of that, tons and tons of, of complicated factors, lead to a pivot to the Nationalist uh, Movement Party or the Nationalist Action Party, the MHP. And that shapes the narrative that becomes increasingly nationalist, increasingly, you know, we talk about, you know, out of the ones nationalism, he wasn't, I would say, a nationalist before 2015. He was someone that I would describe as having an Ottoman Islamic outlook on what he wanted society and foreign policy to look like, but he doesn't really talk about the Turkish nation that much until around that time. And so that changes the AKP's rhetoric. Um, it changes its electoral base. Um, it partners with the MHP, and that shapes everything from, um, you know, who's in bureaucratic posts to uh, kind of the de-democratization of the party to foreign policy. So I think that's a really important factor. The economy is a huge factor in this as well, as we saw in, um, you know, Lira crises, as we saw not only structural problems that needed remedying a long time previously, but really, you know, tough to sustain economic policies like, you know, pushing hot money into the system and trying to, you know, keep these debts, really, really difficult economic situation to sustain, which I think to get to your question has led to a lot of individuals who were with the AKP because of the tangible benefits that they saw and the economic growth that it was able to sustain throughout, say, its first three terms. Um, you know, I think the the problems with the economy, coupled with the nationalistic turn, coupled with the de-democratization and the clear violations of democratic norms and institutions, which we've been seeing since about 2014, but increasingly in elections ever since, 
um, has really left the AKP struggling with how is it going to continue to reach out and maintain the space. And at this point, we see them trying to change electoral law to fit their needs. We see them, you know, as Sally mentioned, I think the Hagia Sophia switch is, it, it's many different things, but in part, it's an attempt to use identity politics to rally a beleaguered base. Um, I think some of its foreign policy gambits can be seen as in that sense as well. Um, but it's very much, uh, I think, the problems with using a polarizing nationalistic rhetoric without the economic base to support it, I think those problems are coming home to roost. And you're seeing it with, you know, AKP members leaving, starting their own parties. We can talk about what that's going to look like. Um, but I think that, you know, this initial boost you get from the nationalism surrounding the coup uh, and the unity that that brought for a little while definitely has, has run out. And I think they're struggling. Celine? I mean. Okay. Sorry, um, um, first off, was the, was the noise from the window too very bad? Because- <laughs> It just sounded like somebody was whistling in the background. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm visiting my parents in Izmir and, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not in my usual uh, conferencing location. Had a vacuum outside, it might be that too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, um, just very briefly then, what um, I, I agree with, with uh, what, what Lizzle said, it's really electorally since 2016, since the coup, I think, I think what's important, I mean, it, it, it bears mentioning again and again, because I think foreign audiences sometimes have a tough time understanding this, but the coup in Turkey is really perceived as an attempt of foreign intervention. It, it's, it's seen sort of an invasion. It, it's seen as a very polite version of an invasion. It's like, you know, and, and as an American, primarily an American invasion, right? An American intervention in Turkish politics and the Turkish state at the very top level, right? And from that point, it's, so, so on its most sort of basic level, it's, it's, an, it's an attempt at um, taking over Turkish sovereignty, basically, is, is uh, what it is to, I'd say, the vast majority of the Turkish public. And then from, from, so going forward from that point on, electorally, right, um, the, the Erdogan government is really a compound of, shall we say, 33% of the electorate plus 17% of the, of the electorate. And that makes up about 50% of the electorate. And that 33% is its sort of base, right? It's the bedrock of the AK party. That's what it, it received in the, in the, basically what it received in, the, uh, in, the, in its first national election. And that's really the part of the electorate that will consistently vote for the AK party no matter what. And these people watch um, only the, the, the hardest core of uh, government news channels. They, um, a vast majority are very religious or semi-religious observers. Um, they they are into the, the the sort of spiritual aspect of things, the, the pan Ottomanism, the, the historical narratives, etc. And the the the, the seventeen percent that latches onto that is a little different, right? It's uh, it's a little more nationalistic, a little more interested in the economic aspects of the art party, right? And it's it's a mixed bag. So when we're talking about the government losing popularity, right? Talking about probably that 17% losing interest a little bit, right? The economy is doing very badly. Oh, you know, they might, they might peel off a little bit. Or um, the, the government is seen as having intervened in the Istanbul elections too, too much. Some of that 17% peels off, right? And that's really how things fluctuate. And what the coup did, I think, is cement that that unity between the 30 and 20 percent or the 33 and 17 percent right really brought them together to the extent that i don't think the government really thinks too much about losing elections anymore i mean they're they're they don't want to lose um municipal elections and they they sort of 
played with live rounds there and and and, and lost and and uh, it was a big sort of uh, wake up call for them. But in a national election, I think um, I think we're past the point where uh, the government would risk losing an election and then maybe step aside. Um, we're, we're we're past that point, right? So so elections are more of a ritual to me. A bit like uh, they are in Russia, as far as I understand it. Yeah. Can I jump in there and ask uh, two questions that, that that have come up from the audience? And I, I'm going to paraphrase them a little bit, but it, it fits right with what you're saying, Salim. And then maybe I'll come to you, uh, Lisa, for your reaction. You know, is is one is 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 if is if the polls that we are seeing, you know, that that, that do show a decline in support for for the AKP. Are accurate, and and I, and I expect that they are. Turkish pollsters know what they're doing. Um, and something that Salim just said, which is, you know, perhaps elections have become more ritual than actual, you know, sort of mechanism for democratic change. Uh, two questions that have come up is: Do you think that there can be a healthy democratic election uh, in the future, uh, with with the uh, with some of the changes that you two have outlined in terms of uh, consolidation of bureaucratic power in the hands of the presidency? Uh, and does Erdogan have an incentive to call an election before 2023, i.e. does he want to go to early elections to capitalize on his popularity as is um, to try and cement his power um, uh, for longer? Um, so those two, can there be a healthy election? No, I mean, um, th there can't be at this point. Um, the the government owns channels of communication. It, it controls them to a very great extent. Um, and it can call elections whenever it wants to at, at the most opportune time to it. And then it can also um, impair uh, the, the, the campaigning capabilities of various actors, right? And that's not just the main opposition party. It's it's also the the left wing groups, the left wing parties, right? To to that extent, um, it's it's very hard to imagine healthy sort of um, wholesome elections, if you will. And will there be or or sh will there be early elections? Probably not. I mean, the thing in Turkey is people talk a lot about early elections and the possibility of early elections. And I think that is at least partly because um, a lot of people who talk about politics in Turkey came of age in the 90s. And um, that sort of thing happened a lot in the 90s. So that um, when, when, when parties looked unpopular, um, they might sort of call early elections or, or you know, they might go for different sort of kinds of alliances. Things were more plastic. Whereas right now, I think, um, if we're talking about elections as being more of a ritual um, than, than an actual um, window for the opposition to the center government, right? then there's no reason to have early elections. I mean, the, the reason we had early elections a couple of times before, I mean, well, actually just, just once in the AK parties, almost 20 years now, was that Erdogan made the calculation that yes, it, I mean, he, he wanted to use, he, he saw that um, the economy would be worse in a couple of years than it was then. And just, he wanted to capitalize on that, which, which made sense at the time. I think, I think though the regime has matured to, to an extent that, um, it doesn't really have to do those things anymore. And it, it goes for the big symbolism and doesn't really think too much about the electoral calculus, thinking that, you know, if push comes to shove, it will, it will make things work in some other way. So I don't think, I don't think we'll see early elections. I think the elections will be in 2023. Lisa, over to you. Yeah, I would, I would largely agree with that. Um, in comparative politics, um, we talk about 
measuring or evaluating elections in terms of free and fair elections. Um, and those mean two different things, uh, related things, but, but different things. So in terms of fair, we talk about even playing field. Do parties have access to the same campaign resources? Is campaign financing regulated? Uh, do they have access to media channels? Um, are their speeches covered in the same way? All that kind of stuff. For a long time in Turkey, we've known that elections aren't fair necessarily. And, and to be to completely fair, it's, it varies a lot across different countries as well even in institutionalized democracies. But only relatively recently have we seen the free component. That is, are individuals able to cast their ballot for the party that they want? And is that ba ballot fairly counted and valued? Um, and that's where we've seen the electoral uh, irregularities since the March 2014 local elections, um, and then increasingly, um, say, in the 2017 referendum, again, held during a state of emergency. Um, and I think it's important to recognize when we're talking about the you know, integrity of elections, that during the referendum, the Supreme Electoral Council decided to count invalid ballots. And that's one of the reasons that um, the, the yes vote wins with the small minority that it does. So we've seen progressively different institutions of governance, different electoral institutions be kind of co-opted or influenced by the AKP such that no, we absolutely can't think of um, say, you know, a free and fair election that's going to take place. Um, but again, I do think it's worth emphasizing that the electoral irregularities that we see, in addition to election violence, are much more concentrated in the Kurdish areas. And part of that, I think, is that not a lot of the rest of the country pays a lot of attention to that. Um, one, and this is to maybe pick up on one of the comments that I saw, um, well, if we don't have free and fair elections, how does Ekrem Yimamo will win, right? right. Um, how does Mansur Yavash win? How do they take Istanbul and Izmir uh, and Ankara? And the answer is, well, they tried to not let Istanbul go. Uh, and that was a really, uh, I think, poorly calculated decision to call that rerun. Um, but part of the, and Sally mentioned this, part of the electoral slip of AKP voters to Imamoglu was because they were disgusted at the way that that was so clearly and blatantly manipulated, um, at least according to, to the polls and the interviews that I've read. So there is a sense that um, there's an attempt to not let those municipalities be taken by opposition parties, but when there are, there's an attempt to cut their ability to effectively administrate uh, them. And that's what we've seen in terms of funding, um, in terms of the Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality seeing some of its land being, uh, the jurisdiction being taken over by um, AKP smaller districts. Um, so there's ways of infringing on that power, even if they do win. Um, but to the question of 2023, I wouldn't expect any uh, early elections unless the AKP believes it's in a very comfortable position to, again, run these kind of as proof to the domestic and international community that yes, we can run elections and look, we can win. Um, we saw, for example, the 2018 presidential election pulled up. It was supposed to be in November, but it was pulled up to June. Partially, I think, to catch opposition parties off guard. And they kind of did. And, and they were relatively successful at that. And a lot of even fervent Republican People's Party supporters will say, they need a concrete plan of action. You know, why, why haven't they got their ducks in a row? Why don't they have a very clear plan that they're going to push forward such that they don't get caught off guard? So I could see if circumstances align, perhaps calling elections. And I think, again, that would be to try to, say, undercut Dautolu and Babajan's attempts to form these new parties. But it's just too big a risk right now. I don't see it. Well, that's it's a question from the audience. And then maybe we'll pivot from elections to uh, to some certain internal things um, and, and foreign policy. Is what's the status, would you say, of the AKP nationalist? National Actions, National Action Movement Party, the MHP. Uh, is that still a healthy partnership? Um, and what do you make of the prospects of some of the AKP splinters? You know, Davutolu and Babajan uh, creating their own parties. You know, ostensibly we would assume that would run in 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 coalition or an alliance with the main opposition parties, the CHP. Um, in, in the E, and will that undercut Erdogan? So maybe we'll start with Lisa and then come back to Salim and then we'll pivot to, to some internal things. Sure, maybe I'll pick up on the second question, which is the, the splinter party um, question. Um, as far as what I can see from the AKP MHP Alliance, um, it seems to still be the AKP needs the MHP's nationalist support to be able to hit um, 
and, and not even that's guaranteed, but to be able to approach that 50% um, threshold, I think it relies quite a bit on MHP. In terms of the splinter parties, you know, I think this has been, there's so many different jokes about like waiting for Gull, waiting for Godot, like the, we've been waiting for some of these actors to form their parties for a very long time. They both, Ahmed Dabutulu and Ali Babajan kind of took their time in announcing their parties. There was questions as to whether Gull was certainly not going to support Dabutulu. They have a big um, rife, uh, conflict rife relationship. Um, but whether he was going to support Babajan. Um, and even now in the news, you see, well, is he just kind of stepping back and he doesn't want to, doesn't want to, over, want to overshadow, overshadow with them? I would say in terms of, um, say, the, the future party, Double Tulu's party. Um, so he has formed this party. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, he's very much tried to reach out to Kurds, which is interesting. You know, he held these rallies in Diyarbakir and he's really trying to, I think, get some of the conservative Kurdish vote. But as we saw in the 2019 elections, when Erdogan tried to get Ujjalan to reach out to Kurds and say, don't vote for the opposition, Kurds have agency and they, you know, they're not going to vote for someone just because you're reaching out to them or you're trying to kind of buy their vote. Davutoglu's election manifesto mentions the Kurds twice, but Kurds remember that he was prime minister during 2015 and 2016. And so I don't think he has a strong ability to draw those votes. Babajan, I think, you know, he walks away from the AKP relatively untarnished. Um, he was an econo uh, economic guru. I think the country needs um, an economic expert right now. Um, he may have more of a chance to rally the conservative right, I would say. And I think I would never see, say, a Republican People's Party Dawutolu alliance. I, that, that just, it makes me quiver. It's weird. But I could, I could see potentially maybe Bapajan um, and the Republican People's Party. It would take a lot of um, PR spinning, I think. But again, he walks out as someone who's not tarnished by corruption. He wasn't sort of one of the super, you know, pious, we need to promote Islam in the country kind of people. So I could, I could potentially see something like that. Salim? Salim? Okay. Um, well, a couple things. A, um, I mean, a lot of people talk about, I think, uh, there being an, an alliance between the AKP and MHP, right? And while, while that is true in, I mean, officially true, it's not really the case in principle. In principle, what happened is that Erdogan effectively now has two parties. He has the AK party and he has the MHP. He owns both brands. Right. So that, I mean, in, in the early years of the AK party, a lot of MHP voters switched over to the AK party. And what happened in the last election when Erdogan, because they just, they just like people at heart, right? And what happened then was that um, in the last election, when Erdogan really had subsumed the MHP brand, a lot of those people then put their ballot Erdogan and then they voted for their old favorite party, which is the MHP, right? And that's why you see that inc that that increase in the MHP's vote and the and the bifurcation and the and the nationalist vote. Now, so so it really doesn't make sense to think of an alliance. It's more of a a, a merger or an acquisition. An acquisition, I think, is is the would be the analogous term. And also for for the the sort of splinter parties and and the and the calculus concerning that, I think in the last elections, the the government's major miscalculation was to redesign electoral laws in a way that would allow parties to work together to enter enter. Um, races with a, a pre-programmed sort of alliance, right? And everyone did this thinking that, uh, you know, these guys in the opposition, they're never going to get together. They're never going to be able to cooperate. And then to his horror, that actually started happening a little bit, 
right? The, the, the polarization within the opposition between nationalists and leftists started to come together. And for, the, for, for municipal elections, at least, these people found a way to work together fairly well, right? And I expect, I mean, Erdogan doesn't like to intervene with the ballot box. He, I mean, that is probably a last, last resort. What, what he usually does is he redesigns the rules in a way that will make it very, very difficult for the opposition to win that particular election, right? So that, that's probably what he's going to do with the splinter parties. I mean, those, those two parties, even if they do somehow get the sympathy of the, the conservative base that he appeals to, um, will, will remain small so that, um, and, and, and if, if he comes up with a rule just tailor-made to keep those parties out, I think probably would be, be, be safe from them. And two, um, Baba Jan and Davutol are just not great politicians. They're not, they're not very good at electoral politics. I mean, some of them, I mean, Baba Jan is, is good at other things, obviously, he's good at economic policy. Um, Davutol is good at just being an Islamic romantic and, and giving <laughs> very long speeches. Uh, not good at electoral politics. And so, so I don't think there's too much for I don't to be afraid of. In terms of Baba John's party, it might be, uh, it might be a threat down the road, sort of the, in, the, in its second generation of, of uh, politicians, but that is still, uh, still far off. So if I can bring in a question from the audience here, and, and Lisa, I saw you nodding your head. So if you wanted to add on that um, as I prompt you in this question, please do. Um, you know, it was in the news, um, I guess, a couple of days before the July 15th anniversary, which was the conversion of the, of the Hagia Sophia from a, um, from a museum back to a mosque. So, you know, correct me if I get my history wrong, but it was a church mosque museum now it's a mosque again and salim i know you wrote a piece in the new york times about it um in, in the op-ed section about how this was sort of the um the capping off of, of maybe islamist or, or or religious conservative politics um and and how this was a, a maybe a powerful narrative setter for Erdogan. you know what do you make about that you know with 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 in terms of what we've just been discussing trends in turkish politics and maybe how it applies to how turkey um either does or does not care about the um, reactions of foreign, of foreign governments? Because the second question I'll follow up with right after this one is, you know, the sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't argument, where if you criticize them, it helps them, but if you don't criticize them, then nothing happens. So maybe with Lisa, we'll start with you and then come back to Sidney. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, on this, I was nodding because I vigorously agree with everything that Salim says. So I, I would also uh, maybe defer to him since he has written the, the New York Times piece. But I think it does fit a lot into what we've been talking about in terms of, I think that this is a move that Erdogan, and not only Erdogan, but you know, the party legacy that he comes from, um, from the National Outlook Movement and, and previous party iterations um, of which the AKP is the current, uh, have tried or have made moves or have um, sort of intimated that this is something that they want to convert this back, that this is part of their legacy. And this would just be a huge, I don't want to say coup, but it would be, it would be a huge move if they were able to um, be able to pull this off. So I think this is a win for him in that sense. Um, I think that this is something that has much more symbolism to it. I don't know how long lasting a move it's going to be. I don't know how long lasting the support or the rallied sort of victory over um, attempts to prevent this from changing. I mean, it's part of it is undoing Ataturk's legacy in some ways, right? I mean, it's, I don't wanna to draw too many comparisons, but I think a lot of what Donald Trump is is undoing Obama's policies. I think that, um, for Erdogan, a lot of what he has tried to do is not only institutional reforms to try to open the space for Islam in the public sphere and a more conservative um, youth as well, although I would highly recommend Gunutol and Aicha Alamdarulu's piece uh, in Foreign Policy two days ago about how Erdogan has lost Generation Z um, and how the pious youth that he's tried to, uh, to um, inculcate or has tried to create or cultivate 
um, is not necessarily going in that direction. Um, I think that is extremely important when we think about 2023 elections, because those people who have had, they've grown up without anyone other than Erdogan are going to vote. But I'm taking it back to elections, so I won't go there. Um, but the Hagia Sophia question, I think, is, you know, and many people before me have said this, but you can only do it once. You know, you've been kind of intimating you're going to do this, you've been talking about it, you've raised it in election rallies, and now you can't redo it, right? So that's a card that you've played that you can't play again. Um, and I don't mean to minimize the, the symbolic importance of it by using that metaphor, but you just can't redo it. In terms of the, the international effects, I think, it, I think there's definitely a, a sense that the AKP wants the international community to pay attention to Turkey and to see how powerful the AKP is in shaping legacies and in um, having influence and being able to uh, control this particular, you know, UNESCO World Heritage Site um, and be able to turn it into a mosque. And even in his speech, Erdogan referred to the Dome of the Rock and he's kind of making these other references to Islamic sites as well. So I think he's trying to connect it to a wider narrative and I do think he enjoys pushback from the West quite a bit. Salim. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think I, I, I agree with those points. They're really great. Um, with with the with Isofia, the thing is that um, I, I I'm having. I mean, uh, so, some people called me about its significance and uh, whether it was all that all as significant as as people made it out to be in Turkey and and. Um, that it was just one thing. I mean, yes, um, electorally, I don't think it'll make a it'll make a big difference, and I don't think that it's sort of it's a game changer. It's just it just tells people, I think, that it's one of those big things um, that Adam was able to do. That, that people have been dreaming about all their lives. I mean, if you were a young person from a, from a conservative uh, family, right, you were most likely told that uh, about how Atatürk walked into the place with the shoes on and, you know, told people to, you know, take those signs down and, and was just not into the, the, the metaphysical aspect of the place. And that um, that that kind of stayed with you, right? And for Erdogan to be able to reverse this in the way he did, right? Which is to say that he took Ataturk's 1934 decision and then put it through the courts and basically said, "This is null and void. I won't have any of it. It might even be fake." He, he didn't really he didn't really specify. It didn't really matter to a lot of people. It was just null and void all of a sudden, right? It was unconstitutional. And then he comes in, he quotes um, Fatih the Conqueror saying um, that, that whoever changes the status of Hagia Sophia is, is going to basically burn in hell for eternity. And, and it's this very, very graphic description of what will happen to this person, right? But he doesn't mention him by name. And then he just moves on, right? And then the day after, or the week after, nobody from the Republican People's Party, nobody from, from any of the Kemalist parties, right, was able to say anything about that at all. Because as far as I understand, historically, it's accurate, right? Um, so where does that leave us, right? I mean, when I, when I see sort of statues of Mustafa Kemal, I, I sort of think that um, they're on borrowed time now. That that sort of thing, that that kind of um, historical narrative, is now changing. It was always changing, but it's now changing more quickly, in a direction that that uh, the government is setting. So I think I do think that is a powerful thing for him to have, and for Agus Sophia to be uh, a part of it. And I think that he can. He probably can sort of work on that theme more and more. And Agha Sophia will 
I think probably continue to be a source of controversy. Right? So very basically, I think, for example, they're, they're now going to use lasers or, or some sort of optical illusion to obscure the uh, Christian symbols um, on, the, on the dome and other places. Now, I don't think any Muslim is going to feel good about that. I think all the people worshiping in there are going to feel terrible about worshiping in a place that, that's, that's full of Christian iconography. And it's only sort of, it, 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 they could touch it if they reached out to it. It's only, it's only covered by lasers and all sorts of things. They're not going to like that very much. And it's only a matter of time until people are going to sort of go over that with, with uh, some sort of paint or it's going to be some sort of compromise. It, the, the important thing is politically, it's going to be a source of more and more controversy. And I think politically, that's very useful for this government. Maybe perhaps the final question, because we have about eight minutes left. We'll, we'll, we'll touch, I'm going to try and condense a couple of questions from the audience. And, and I'm going to pivot to, I'm going to take them, I'll, I'll, I'll condense them and sort of add my own to this, is, you know, we've seen a much more assertive and aggressive Turkish foreign policy, um, particularly since 2015. Um, and I would argue that that foreign policy is framed in sort of us versus them, i.e. Turkey is responding to what it feels like is in particularly Western attempts to either encircle it or to weaken it. Um, we are coming up our own elections here in the U.S., you know, so even if we, if we have a Biden administration or if we have a second term of the Trump administration, what should they expect, you know, from Turkish foreign policy in places like Syria or Libya? I know it's a big question and I'm giving you uh, about six minutes to answer it, so three minutes each. Um, and what do you think that suggests to sort of about, um, about uh, uh, the direction of the country past um, 2021? Um, I can start briefly if you want on that. Um, yeah, I would say that, in fact, to kind of tie this entire event together, I would say that one of the legacies of the coup is an increasingly militaristic, increasingly aggressive foreign policy. Um, I think that, uh, and in fact, if you read uh, Sinam Adar's work on this, it's really uh, fascinating in terms of um, how the military, you know, obviously was purged, restructured, um, has been uh, the military uh, defense industrial complex in Turkey has been invested in um, and that there is a need to kind of use these forces uh, in a way such that they there's a nationalistic feeling behind it and they also feel as though um, you know they're contributing to to the national cause and so there's you know this you know it, from the the incursions into northern Syria to Libya I mean all of that is partially domestic politics partially rallying voters. It's partially about getting leverage with Russia. It's partially about securing, um, at least with, with Libya, securing interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, you know, I think that we're going to see an increasingly, at least under uh, an Erdogan presidency, an increasingly aggressive pushback, um, an increasingly aggressive uh, assertion of Turkey's role um, in the Middle East, uh, in the region as a whole, and even globally. Um, and I think that the aggressive hostile relationship with the U.S. is another legacy of the coup. There's a very, Selim mentioned this, there's a very deep, deep-seated belief that the U.S. is intricately involved um, in the coup attempt, has been trying to prevent the rise of a strong Muslim Turkey for years. Um, all kinds of conspiracy theories um, that are rife uh, underscore that. So I think you're going to uh, see the, the effects of that with continued distrust of the US um, and the ability to use the US as kind of a nationalist punching bag. So every time the US refuses to hand Gulen over, Erdogan can say, look, look, they're, they're harboring a terrorist, they're harboring someone who tried to bring our nation down. Um, Donald Trump makes Turkey's policy very easy for Erdogan, um, but US Congress is trying to push back against that. So I would just say, um, I think that, that that aggressive, assertive role in the region is partially an effect of the, the coup, but I think it's also the coup attempt, but it's also um, kind of the realization of a much stronger, more assertive role for Turkey in the region that Erdogan has been trying to, uh, to realize for quite a long time. Selim? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that sounds great. I'm I would also, I would expect, I would expect 
developments along those lines as well. Um, I just emphasize, I'd, I'd emphasize the role of uh, the idea of soil, you know, the idea of territory. That, that I feel like that is really coming back in the way that this government is, is thinking about foreign policy. They're really into taking over um, and they're, I think they're thinking more and more about the idea of changing the map because I mean, early on and well, not early on, but in the middle of Um, people in the government were talking a lot about, you know, Bilal Tejavit in 19, 1974 and how Turkey had done the Cyprus peace operation and that it had been fairly su successful in its, uh, in its chosen objective, right? And I want, for him, it was very important to, to top that, right? And, and going forward, I think what for him personally is going to be very important is to change the map and to change structurally the, the makeup of the country, right? So that you have people uh, coming up with all sorts of different maps uh, of uh, Northern Syria and parts of Northern Iraq, sort of uh, coming on to Turkey. Uh, Northern Cyprus is going to be, I think, an obvious sort of stepping stone in that way, that it, considering that, that the Europeans aren't going to be able to come up with a solution on the island, right? It's, it's only a matter of time until that part of the island then becomes part of Turkey, I think. And then further on, um, there's going to be, yeah, a, a greater expansion, I think. Well, we've come basically to the end of the hour. Um, we have about two minutes left. I mean, um, I can give it to the panelists to give about a 30 second wrap up, um, maybe perhaps summarizing what has been a very fruitful um, um, uh, uh, discussion. So why don't I give 30 seconds each and then, uh, then we'll, we'll start to close it out. So Lisa, the floor is yours, then Salim just pick up when she's done. Oh, wow, 30 seconds wrap up, awesome. Um, I think I would just say, you know, as, as a Turkey watcher, one of the most interesting paradoxes to me is that institutionally Erdogan is in the most uh, powerful position that he's ever been in terms of consolidation of power in the executive, in terms of reconfiguring the judiciary, um, the legal system and so forth, the military, um, although I think he's always going to be slightly uh, worried about what might potentially come next, which again I think is one of the reasons to keep the military active. Um, but from from a legitimacy standpoint and from a political standpoint, I think he's at his weakest. Um, and I think that the steps that we're seeing him take, um, whether it's a more aggressive foreign policy or whether it's the, the Hagia Sophia or um, you know, some of the other economic policies that are continuing to try to um, you know, maintain the lira at a particular level, um, you know, kind of really debilitating policies that are put in place to try to maintain this image of stability and security. Um, you know, I think, and, and you have an a opposition that has the potential to come together. Um, I think it's a really precarious position for him to be in, which is why we're seeing the increasing, um, you know, uh, attempt to try to silence opposition and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's a paradox that institutionally he's very strong, politically he's very weak. Um, and I think the question is how long can this, um, you know, can this status quo remain in place? Salim, the floor is yours for 30 seconds. Yeah, I think, I think that that is um, the big question. Institutionally, obviously, he's, he's very, very strong and uh, he's got all this economic might and political might and institutional in terms of uh, foreign policy. Um, things, things are going fairly well for this government. And um, the, the, the question is how sustainable is it and where is it going to lead? And in that way, I don't think Turkey's all too different from a lot of similar countries, uh, that, well, similar political movements that are happening in, in, you know, from, from Poland to India, right? The, this sort of neo-nationalism that's, that's going around. Turkey, it, it happened fairly early in Turkey and it's, it's very um, strong in Turkey, but Turkey's not 
an outlier in the sense. And uh, I think that's a good way to end it. So with that, I want to thank everybody for, for joining today, um, either clicking on the link or dialing in. Um, if you enjoyed the conversation, that means you'll probably enjoy what we do at FPRI. So make sure to check out our website, fpri.org. And if you're interested in supporting FPRI, we are always interested in that support. So uh, uh, check us out. And with that, uh, thank you, everybody. Have a nice day, evening, night. Uh, and Lisa and Salim, uh, until next time. Thanks very much, Aaron. Sure. Thank you.